All right. Um, welcome, everyone, to the Circus uh, Lunch Seminar. Today we are very fortunate to have Ari Jules as our speaker. Um, Ari uh, was at RSA Laboratories for a long time um, as uh, chief scientist, and he did uh, a lot of uh, has done a lot of very influential work in um, security, privacy, cryptography. Uh, some things in particular that I'm familiar with and have uh, influenced uh, my own work is work on uh, 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 RFID security, proofs of retrievability. So proofs, so proofs of retrievability are how can you be sure that your data is still in the cloud the way you um, uh, uh, the data that you uploaded hasn't 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 been uh, corrupted or lost. Uh, also, uh, work on uh, uh, fuzzy. What did you call them? Uh, it's kind of fuzzy, I, I fuzzy, fuzzy, fuzzy commitment. Was, we'll just call it fuzzy cryptography. Right. Fuzzy guess, cryptography, right. um, uh, which has led to a really nice line of work by Adam and others on uh, you know and, uh, around questions about how you can do cryptography uh, based on a uh, fingerprint and other um, biometrics. And so today he'll be talking to us about uh, more very interesting work on password security. Thanks, Salir. I'm going to talk today about the challenges of building intrusion-resilient systems. By intrusion-resilient, I mean a system in which it's possible to maintain security even after compromise, or at least partial compromise of the system. But before I get into the technical meat of the talk, I'd like to motivate it by recounting an episode that took place during the Second World War. In 1943, uh, German intelligence made a very important discovery. A body washed up onto the beach near a remote fishing village in Spain. This body belonged to a Royal Marine captain, acting major, by the name of William Bill Martin. Now, as many of you may know, Spain was technically neutral during the Second World War. But it just so happened that there was a German agent stationed nearby who learned of the discovery of the body. And he also learned that Martin was hand carrying a letter. And it appeared that Martin was acting as a courier. This was a pivotal time during the war, because the Germans knew that the Allies were about to stage a major invasion of Europe, but they didn't know exactly where. The letter on Martin's body referred to a plan for a certain General Jumbo Wilson to invade Greece. But consequently, the Germans got this very important piece of intelligence, and on the express orders of Hitler, redeployed several panzer divisions and other resources to Greece to meet the attack. Well, what happened? The Allies invaded Sicily. It turns out that Captain Martin never existed. He was a plant, a decoy, a fabrication. And the British went to extraordinary lengths to create this bogus marine captain. They found the corpse of a homeless man who died from pneumonia with fluid in his lungs to create a an appearance of consistency with drowning. They knew that that German agent was stationed nearby. In fact, that motivated their choice of location for the body. They fabricated a letter from Martin's father, love letters from his fiancée, talking about uh, horrible dark hints of his future is being sent off, and so on and so forth. They fabricated a bill for an engagement ring. They even had a photo of his fiancée, who happened to be a secretary in MI5. Now, with their typical wry humor referring to the appearance of the corpse, the British referred to this as Operation Mincemeat. And it's estimated that Operation Mincemeat was a vast success. It saved something like 40,000 Allied lives. And of course, it was also a very colorful episode and gave rise to a movie entitled The Man Who Never Was. And it's a great movie, by the way. See the poster here. I'm going to close the door. So one excellent movie as well. So you appreciate that Martin was a decoy, a fake object that was made to look real to deceive an adversary. And of course, decoys have been used since time immemorial as counterintelligence tools. In computer security, we often refer to them as honey objects. Most of you, for instance, have heard of honey pots, which are servers designed to lure adversaries for observation. There are also things uh, known as honey tokens, bogus credit cards, for instance, with which a database will often be sown to enable detect detection of a breach. Uh, 
there's been quite a bit of work uh, at uh, Columbia on decoy documents, fake documents to detect insider attacks in particular. My contention in this talk is that honey objects are undervalued as defensive tools. And so I'm going to address two key questions. The first is, how can we apply honey objects to the most important, the most pressing problems in computer security and privacy? Problems like password breaches in the cloud and compromise of personal data on mobile devices. The second question is, how can we do this in a principled way? Right. Today, honeypots and so on and so forth tend to be deployed in a rather ad hoc manner. So the question is, is there some way to progress from what is today essentially an art of deception to something more like a science? And at the end of this talk, I'll describe a larger research vision for addressing this broader question of how to build intrusion resilient systems. I'm going to discuss, though, uh, two ideas in particular today. One is known as honey words. It's a defense against password breaches, a way of detecting them. The second, obviously related concept, is known as honey encryption. Honey encryption aims to achieve something counterintuitive, namely strong encryption of messages using weak keys, like passwords. And I'll talk first about honey words. And this is joint work with uh, Ron Rivest at MIT. It was presented uh, recently at ACM CCS. So there's good news and bad about password breaches. The good news is that whenever I go to give a talk like this, a convenient example of a disastrous breach crops up for my use. So just uh, five or six weeks ago, Yahoo lost something like uh, 250, 300 million passwords. Great example. Of course, Yahoo isn't alone. Adobe had a substantial breach in which they lost 130 million passwords, thankfully encrypted, unfortunately encrypted under ECB mode. LinkedIn had a fairly large breach. Uh, Evernote had a substantial breach involving 50 million passwords, eHarmony's had a breach, and so on and so forth. And of course, these are just the ones we know about. These are probably just the tip of the iceberg. This is the good news. The bad news, of course, is that all of this is bad news. Right? And password breaches are becoming a plague for the industry. Now, generally, as most of you know, passwords are protected by means of hashing. That's to say, when a user like our canonical user Alice, registers a password with an online service, proffers some password P, the service doesn't store the password P in explicit form. Rather, it applies a cryptographic one-way function known as a hash function to P, and it stores the hash of P. Now when Alice logs in, or somebody purporting to be Alice, using a password P prime, this process is repeated. P prime is hashed. And the hash of P prime is compared with the registered hash to determine whether this is truly Alice or not. The nice thing about password hashing, the reason that we go to this trouble to begin with, is that if it's done right, it forces an attacker that learns a set of hashes to mount a brute force attack to extract the underlying passwords. What I mean by this is that given H of P, the only way for an attacker feasibly to determine P is to make repeated guesses P prime and keep hashing them until he or she discovers a match. Additionally, hashing can be slowed down in various ways, hardened. A popular tool for this is bcrypt. There's another one called scrypt that relies on memory resources to constrain an attacker. Now, all of this seems very good. It seems like hashing is doing what we want it to do. But there's a problem. There's a fundamental limitation to hashing. Namely the fact that users tend to select weak passwords, passwords that are easy to guess. This is well exemplified by a nice study conducted by Joe Bonneau in 2012 of a corpus of just about 70 million Yahoo passwords in which he found, for instance, quite saliently, that 1% of users had the same password. It was probably 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. He didn't reveal it. but. That, that's a particularly popular one. So 1% had the same password. 50% of users had passwords that Bonneau estimated could be cracked with effort about 2 to the 22. So about 22 bits of underlying entropy. So that's about 4 million guesses to crack any password in the weaker half of the database. Additionally, password crackers are getting better and better. One of the ways that they're improving is by modeling the selection of passwords by real users. 
The state of the art is reflected in a password cracker by Matt Weir and colleagues, developed in 2009, uses probabilistic context-free grammars. All of these password crackers leverage the fact that there was a massive breach of plain text passwords in 2009. 32 million passwords leaked from a service called RockU. So this informs those who design password crackers about how users actually select their passwords. For this reason, good and even salted hashes are generally inadequate. And I'm just going to assume for pedagogical purposes and for simplicity in the remainder of this talk that hashes can be cracked and passwords, therefore, effectively in the clear. I'll just make that simplifying assumption. So when a breach occurs, the adversarial game we're playing looks something like this. The adversary mounts what we can think of as a smash and grab attack. It compromises the system temporarily and usually passively and steals a snapshot of the password file. Then the adversary attempts to impersonate a user. So in the case of Alice, for instance, what the adversary will do is break in, seize Alice's password, and again, for simplicity, we'll just assume it's in the clear, and then attempt to impersonate her, submit her name and her password. Well, this is a simple game, of course. The adversary always wins this game. The idea behind honey words, the concept I'm going to discuss now, is to change this game to store for Alice not a single password, but rather a collection of passwords, some n passwords, of which only one, p sub i, for some randomly selected i, is the true password. The rest are bogus passwords, decoys that we'll refer to as honey words. We'll refer to the full list here as sweet words. So now the game has changed a little bit. The task of the adversary, after corrupting a database, is to guess the index of the correct password to figure out what i is. So the best that the adversary can do is to pick a password essentially at random, if we've chosen our decoys well, and attempt to impersonate Alice using password p sub j. If we've done our job correctly, if we've constructed entirely plausible looking decoys, then the probability of the adversary succeeding is about 1 in n, so fairly small. Concretely, we hope that the game looks like this, that the adversary sees a list of plausible looking passwords and has to figure out which one is Alice's. Well, a couple of key design questions here. The first is how we go about verifying whether a submitted password is correct, right? particularly if it's a sweet word. Obviously, we don't want to store the index i alongside the list of sweet words because then an adversary will know which is the true password. The second question is, how do we produce these bogus passwords? How do we produce realistic looking passwords to deceive an adversary? There are lots of other design questions here, many of them addressed in the paper, but I'm not going to have time to talk about them today, of course. So let's talk first about verification. We envision that there's a computer system which is capable of storing a collection of sweet words, and we're going to add to it, annex to it, a second system that we'll refer to as a honey checker. So we're going to design a distributed system here. The job of the honey checker is very simple. The honey checker simply stores the index of Alice's correct password. That's all it does. So when Alice logs in, when anyone submits a sweet word on behalf of Alice, what the computer system is going to do is to transmit to the honey checker the index of the submitted sweet word. So if Alice submits the correct password, p sub i, then i will be sent to the honey checker. The honey checker will compare it, compare it with the stored index and admit the user, or validate the authentication if it's indeed correct. Now, if an adversary tries to log in and submits an incorrect pass password, sweet word in particular, the adversary has breached the database, has the list of sweet words, and chooses one incorrectly, You'll see that the index j is going to go to the honey checker, and the honey checker will be able to determine that it's incorrect by comparing it with the stored index, and will sound the alarm accordingly. So in brief, the, the verification rule for honey words is this. If the true password is submitted, then the user is authenticated and everything proceeds normally. If a password is submitted that isn't on the list of sweet words, incorrect password isn't on the list of sweet words, for instance, if Alice has made a typo, then we treat this as a normal authentication failure. Where things get interesting is if a honey word is submitted, right, an incorrect sweet word. 
In this case, the honey check will sound the alarm because this is likely to happen only after a breach. In other words, it constitutes strong evidence that a breach has occurred and that evidence can be amassed, of course, over multiple submissions. Honey words, if they're properly chosen, we expect will rarely be submitted under benign conditions. So do we know how many breaches happen by somehow getting inside the database rather than by just trying to get lucky on the outside of the database? I would say the vast majority of uh, serious breaches happen in the way that I described, that uh, an attacker gets a hold of the hashes and then goes and cracks them, and that's relatively easy to do. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's difficult to mount a good online attack. Not impossible, of course, if 1% of users are choosing the same password. But uh, online attacks are also detectable. Right? You can see that there's a series of password failures. Mary? So, uh, related to this 1%, one, 1%, so uh, should we be thinking of N is less than 100, I guess, uh, if we don't want, um, if we want honey words to be rarely submitted, if, if like there's a password that occurs 1% of the time, and we want our honey words to look like real passwords, then we probably need to include this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Or well, that wouldn't necessarily be detrimental. If 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is not the password of the real user, then actually it makes a, a good honey word. Nominally, we expect n will be something like 20, and I'll talk about that. But it's, that, that should be fine. What prevents the other from the same communication between the server and the word checker? Uh, well, I'll, I'll just assume that that's a well-secured channel. If an adversary is able to mount an active attack of that type, you've got more serious problems than, than, than ha password hash cracking. Right. So that's a harder problem, and therefore I'll punt on it. Let's say that. <laughs> OK. And the important thing to observe here is that there's no change in the user experience. Right? Alice has no idea that there are honey words being used in the background here. So we feel that there's some nice features to this design. The first is that the computer system doesn't have to be modified very much. All it does is store a bunch of sweet words, and when a sweet word is submitted, transmit the corresponding index to the honey checker. But we get the benefits of distributed security. If either component is compromised, it isn't fatal to the integrity of the system as, the whole, as a whole. It will weaken it somewhat, but we get essentially graceful degradation and security. So there's no single point of compromise. And in fact, if both components of the system get compromised, both the honey checker and the computer system, we're no worse off than we would be in the normal case where we've just got a list of hash passwords. The attacker will know, thanks to compromising the honey checker, the in indices of correct passwords, but still has to crack their corresponding hashes. So that's essentially the situation today. A particularly nice feature is the fact that the honey checker can be minimalist. Right? It can practically be an input-only device. All it does is ingest indices and perhaps occasionally emit a heartbeat. And if a honey word is submitted, of course, sound an alarm. Now, one of the configurations we particularly favor has the honey checker sitting offline in the sense that it resides downstream in, say, a security operations center, which tends to enjoy special isolation from the rest of the network. In this case, the honey checker isn't active in the authentication itself. It is not built into this tight loop, but it can provide a rapid alert in case of a breach. And you also appreciate that if the honey checker goes down, users can still authenticate. Authentication will be weakened, of course, because any submitted sweet word will allow a user to get into the system, but as soon as the uh, honey checker goes back online, if you've cached the indices transmitted by the computer system, you can detect the breach. So that's addressing the question of verification. As I mentioned, we also have to think about how to generate honey words. To give you some sense of why this can be challenging, let me give you a puzzle. So I've taken a password here from the RockU database. Remember, that's the database of 32 million passwords that got leaked a few years ago. And I've embedded in a list of randomly generated passwords. Can anyone tell me which is the correct password? Right, it's pretty obvious here, right? The, the fourth password is the correct password. It has a structure distinctly different from the random passwords. Right, so this naive approach to creating honey words doesn't work. In the paper, we propose a number of different methods. One of them we refer to as chaffing with a password model. The idea here is to observe that password hash crackers contain implicit models of how users select passwords. 
as I mentioned, the designers of password crackers are, have been educated by leaks like that of the Rockyou database. So essentially, implicit in a password cracker is a probability distribution describing the way that real users select passwords. Therefore, a good way to generate Honeywords is to sample from this distribution. In other words, to repurpose the cracker as a generator. And in the paper, we propose a very simple splicing generator that produces, yields a puzzle that looks something like this. So you can see there's a Rockyou password in here and a bunch of Honeywords generated by this, uh, this simple generator in the paper. And it's a little bit more difficult to distinguish the real password from the Honeywords. Any guesses as to? You're going you're gonna to guess? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, before you ask a question, maybe you can guess the, the correct password. <laughs> Any other guesses? Anyway, you can see it's hard. Actually, you had the right password, though. It, it's, it's number two. Okay, that's not obvious. But you had a question as well. Why aren't they other passwords from other users? Store them as passwords. That's actually uh, a, a good idea. It's not as, as simple as it seems, but I'll mention that idea uh, in a few slides. But that is a good way to, to select any words. Yeah, so the suggestion was take other users' passwords. Uh, there's still some problem cases with this approach of generating passwords synthetically, as I described. And to show you why that method can be a problem, I've given you another puzzle here. So again, we've got a, a real Rockyou password and a bunch of synthetically generated ones. Can anyone tell me which is the true password here? <laughs> this is a real password from the Rockyou database. There's some, <laughs> there's some very strange people out there. And one of them is evidently a Rockyou customer. So second he method, log in very much. sorry? He doesn't log in very much. <laughs> no, I suspect he doesn't log in very much. And it's probably hard to crack his hash too, right? which is another nice feature of this, uh, this password. In the paper, another method we propose, we refer to as chaffing by tweaking, helps deal with problem cases of this type. And again, here we draw on password cracking technology. So Inshin Zhang and colleagues observed in 2010 then when users have to reset their passwords, which I assume is something you have to do here periodically every 90 days or 180 days or something, they tend not to choose new passwords whole cloth. Rather, what they do, and most of us I think are probably guilty of doing this, I know that I am, is uh, append a digit to the end of their regular password and when they have to reset their password, tweak the digit. So Zhang et al. observed that because users tend to tweak passwords, if you have an old password, it's pretty easy to figure out the new password. Well, tweaks, as it turns out, are actually a nice way to generate honey words. And here's an example of a real Rockyou password that's been tweaked. Any guesses as to which is the true password here? Right, there's no, basically no way to guess this. Number one happens to be the, the correct one. There's still some difficult cases here, though. So I'll give you another puzzle to illustrate this. This is one that uh, a colleague crafted that I was unable to figure out because I don't have sufficient knowledge of contemporary culture. Any, any, can anyone tell me which is the correct password here? Blink 182. Yes, Blink 182. It's a, I, I did a paper on passwords. It's, it's a band. So okay, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that. I don't know if you were aware of that. Okay, I'm glad I'm not the only one who didn't know this. Now I know. <laughs> okay, so what you observe about this password is that it's semantically significant in the sense that if you tweak it, you'll break it. And the probability of generating it is fairly low, right? at least lower than the probability a real user will select it as, as her or his password. Dealing with passwords of this type is a, is a special challenge. And this relates to natural language processing, for instance. Uh, in an upcoming paper, to answer your question, one of the techniques we propose for dealing with this problem is to use other people's passwords as honey words. It turns out that this strategy is not as easy to implement as you might expect particularly if there are multiple compromises of a database. If the, user, if the attacker gets multiple snapshots, then associating one user's uh, honey words with other users turns out to be problematic. Thankfully, though, honey word generation doesn't have to be perfect to be good and effective. And to see this, let you be the probability of distribution on user password selection, by which I mean u of p is the probability a user chooses password p. Let G be a distribution on Honeyword generation. This means our generator yields password P with probability G of P. It turns out then that given a list of sweet words, 
an adversary's best guessing strategy is to pick the sweet word that maximizes the ratio of u to g. And so you can see, for instance, why in chaffing with a password model, this password is a particularly dangerous one. The probability that this thing is going to be generated synthetically is practically zero, infinitesimally small. But the probability a user will select it is evidently not infinitesimally small. So the ratio u to g is very large, essentially infinite. Therefore, if an attacker sees this one, a savvy attacker, this is going to be the password she chooses. In practice, we expect it to use something like 20 sweet words. This is just a notional uh, parameter. But you'll see that if we have a flat honey word distribution, that's to say one in which our generator is perfect, perfectly mimics the selection of passwords by real users, then adversary will hit a honey word 95% of the time, which is very good. But it's also worth observing that we don't need perfect flatness to detect an attack, at least systemically. Say in an extreme case, an adversary can rule out all but two sweet words as, as uh, the valid password. Then the larger the number of accounts the attacker targets, the higher the probability of detecting the attack. And in fact, the probability of the attacker evading detection uh, decays exponentially in the number of accounts that the, that the attacker has, has attempted to, uh, to breach. Additionally, it's possible to hybridize generation strategies to inoculate a system against the failure of a particular one. So for example, we might, using chaffing with a password as a, uh, chaffing with a password model as a uh, honey word generation technique, produce a list of sweet words like this. Right? And it's pretty obvious which is the, the true password here. But suppose, as a hedge against the failure of that generation strategy, chaffing with a password model, we also tweaked our passwords so that our list of sweet words instead looked like this. Well, then it wouldn't be so obvious which was the true password. Is it the one on the left or is it the one on the right? In the larger landscape here, you can think of honey words as a kind of poor man's distributed security system. And there are other practical approaches to password breach protection. Hashing I've mentioned, as worth also uh, noting that there's a big password hashing competition underway at the moment. While I was at RSA, a system we developed called distributed credential protection managed passwords using distributed crypto. It actually split a password cryptographically across a pair of servers such that if one server was compromised, no information at all was leaked about the underlying password. This is substantially stronger than Honeywords, but it's also rather more difficult to deploy. Now, th this was turned into a product a couple of years ago, 2012. There have been attempts to use general secure function evaluation to accomplish the same task. And there's even a uh, company, Dyadic Security, that's attempting to do this. But we believe that Honeywords strike a particularly attractive balance between ease of use and, and security, ease of deployment and security. There's little modification required to the computer system, as you've seen. The Honey Checker can be quite minimalist and involve very little code. It's even possible to verify the correctness of the code. And not to be underestimated, the idea is conceptually simple. Honeywords are something that can be implemented by just about anyone. Okay. Now I'm going to move on to the second idea, honey encryption. But before I do that, are there any other questions about Honeywords? particularly you know, their common passwords, and I don't remember whether I used this common password or that one. There's a decent chance it might appear in my honey, honey list of the... Yeah, so there certainly is a chance of false positives, and that's why I was saying that uh, when the alarm is sounded, it's evidence of a breach, not proof conclusive, and you want to treat it as, as such. So if the alarm sounds well, it's, you, you, you'll investigate, but you'll keep in mind the fact that, that false positives are certainly possible. And again, the goal is to protect against systemic attack. Okay, let me talk about uh, the next idea then. The question I had in terms of the analysis you were, you were presenting, um, sort of more principled analysis in terms of these two distributions, U and G. So, so one issue that comes up with regular password breaches is the fact that um, 
you know, it, it doesn't matter if some of the passwords are hard to, to guess by brute force, right? All, all that matters are the, the easy ones, right? And, and for, for, for sweet words, um, it, you could imagine that even, even if only a small, if based on the sweet words list, even if most of the time I can't pick out the real password, right? If, you know, 0.1% of the time it's obvious which is the right password, then I can, as an attacker, what I should do is only attempt to breach, you know, only attempt to uh, uh, log in as, as a user where the, the sort of real password was seemed fairly obvious. Right. I mean, if you can establish that with absolute certainty, or, or then that's close, the, I mean, uh, well, close doesn't count here, right? Because then if the adversary is mounting a systemic attack, uh, he's, he or she is going to be detected when sweet words come into the system. Which, that will be a fairly rare event otherwise. So you have to have a pretty substantial failure of the generator for an adversary to be able to impersonate multiple users without detection. That's the point here. Yeah, so I, I guess the, Sort of technically, what I was going to ask is, it seems like what you're interested in is not exactly you know the maybe the, the average chance of guessing the right um, password from the list, but some other more more complicated uh, number, which is you know what what's the probability that I actually am fairly certain about uh, which is the right password? I guess. Technically, it seems there's, there's a question there of, of whether or not we can you know, get a, a more refined an analysis. Of, uh, yeah, it, well, it also depends, of course, on your security objectives for the system as a whole. Right? If you're concerned about any one account being compromised, which is more likely to be a problem in an enterprise setting, say, than a consumer setting, mm -hmm. you're going to have a very different metric than if you're concerned about a large number of accounts getting compromised and you're incurring legal liability and so on and so forth. So the, the overarching goal does influence the, the model and the effectiveness of the generator. OK, let me talk now about uh, Honey Encryption. This is joint work with my colleague Tom Ristenpart, University of Wisconsin. And uh, will be presented at Eurocrypt in May. But I insist it's practical nonetheless. <laughs> we'll talk after. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, as we've seen, users tend to select weak passwords, and this means that password hashes can be easily cracked. This is bad news, as I suggested at the beginning of the talk. But weak passwords are not just a problem for user authentication, they're also a problem in cases in which you want to encrypt something using a password, so-called password-based encryption. Okay. Suppose a message M is encrypted under password P to yield some ciphertext to C, in general now, if you use ordinary password-based encryption, an attacker that guesses the password can crack the ciphertext and learn the underlying message and know that she's done this correctly. Given the weakness of passwords in ordinary use, guessing P is not too hard for many users. So ordinary users' PBE ciphertexts are vulnerable, highly vulnerable, to brute force guessing. This is something we refer to as the brute force bound. A good example of where this brute force bound is problematic is the case of password vaults, sometimes called password managers. I'm sure many of you use these things. Password manager is a uh, application that allows you to take a database of passwords and their associated accounts and encrypt it under a so-called master password. So if if this thing is sitting on your mobile device, for instance, your mobile device gets compromised, in principle, you don't have to worry about the passwords conveniently cached in the manager being leaked because they're encrypted on this master password. They're sitting in a vault. The problem here is that users choose passwords badly. And there's reason to suspect they choose master passwords even worse than ordinary passwords. Well, why? Number one, they're having constantly to type these things in to unlock their vaults. And number two, they're often having to do this on mobile devices, right? with those fiddly uh, keyboards. These things are, as I mentioned, particularly possible, uh, popular for things like the iPhone. And uh, LastPass and Dashlane are examples of uh, password vault applications that many people are using today. It turns out that these vaults are also typically stored in the cloud. 
and typically protected essentially only under the master password. Why? Because it makes it easy to synchronize among devices. Right? If you encrypt the vault under a device-specific key and the device gets lost or broken, the vault is gone. And that's very bad from a usability perspective. And there's already been a breach of one of these services. Uh, LastPass had a breach in which some number of vaults got leaked. We don't, we don't know how many. But this underscores the sensitivity of these services today. And of course, a cracked vault is very serious. It's in some regards much more serious than a major breach of the type, for instance, than Yahoo suffered. Right? Every Yahoo user has had one password compromised. If your password vault gets cracked, all of your passwords get compromised. Right? For the individual involved, this is catastrophic. So the question arises, is there some way for us to offer protection beyond the brute force bound? Well, an obvious way to do this is to slow down decryption, right? to implement something analogous to bcrypt for the case of hashing. But we really can't slow down decryption enough to make a substantial dent in the power of an adversary without inconveniencing the user, slowing the user experience as well. So ultimately, the question arises, can we somehow encrypt a ciphertext with a low entropy key such that it can't be decrypted with high probability, even by an unbounded adversary, an adversary that can make essentially an unlimited number of guesses? If you think about this for a moment, it should seem impossible. Now I'll show you how to do it. The key idea here, the key piece of trickery, is to create a cipher in which an adversary can't tell whether a message has been decrypted correctly. Or to view it another way, the cipher text decrypts plausibly under any key or password. Many of you may be familiar with this property from, for instance, the one-time pad. A one-time pad works like this. You take a message. We, we invade Sicily, for instance. I'm going to show you a particular flavor of one-time pad that uh, encodes um, letters in their lexicographic order. You generate, then, a key that's equal in length to the message. And this key is generated by selecting symbols uniformly at random, in this case, letters uniformly at random. To produce the ciphertext, you simply add the message to the key. And so in this example, for instance, you'll see that W has a lexicographic value of 23. W corresponds to 23, A corresponds to 1. If you add 23 to 1, you get 24, X. Indeed, that's the first letter of the ciphertext. Proceed like that, you get the full ciphertext. The beauty of the one-time pad is that, given a ciphertext, any message is plausible as the corresponding plaintext. You can cook a key that yields that message. And of course, keys are chosen uniformly at random, so essentially all messages are equally likely. But there are a few problems with the one-time pad. The major problem for our purposes is that this pad is a high entropy key. Right? You can think of this as a very, very strong password. And again, we would like to be able to encrypt using weak passwords. So an obvious tweak here would be to design a one-time pad system that works with very little entropy. And suppose in the extreme, for instance, that we had only one bit of entropy, and therefore just two possible keys. Well, then we would encrypt by taking our message, picking one of the keys at random, flipping a, flipping a coin, rolling a die, and then generating our ciphertext. The problem here is that an adversary sees this ciphertext and knows the two keys. Right? We've got only one bit of entropy, so the only uncertainty the adversary has is which of these two keys has been used. Adversary takes these keys, decrypts the ciphertext under each of these two keys, and it becomes pretty obvious which is the correct underlying message. This one looks totally implausible if you know that the underlying message is an English language sentence. So there have been a number of previous approaches to encryption using low entropy keys. One known as entropic encryption, which uh, Adam has worked on, for instance, uh, which seeks to achieve Shannon-type security with a little bit less entropy than a, than a full pad. There was a very nice scheme uh, developed by a company called Arcot back in 1999 that corresponds closely to the scheme I'm going to describe to you today. But it only works for RSA, and it requires a modification of the RSA crypto system, which is undesirable. But it's a, it's a very clever scheme. Another clever scheme closely related to what I'll show you today is one devised at Stanford called Camouflage. And this scheme is designed specifically to protect password vaults by creating essentially a bunch of honey vaults under honey master passwords. 
approach I'm going to talk about today, as I said, is, is honey encryption. And to describe the goals to you, I'll do, as cryptographers like to do, I'll, I'll do this by uh, first talking about the underlying adversarial game. Yeah. So the game is this. We've got a message distribution, that's to say a probability distribution describing the way that users select messages. We're going to play a message recovery game. A message is picked from this message distribution, and then a key is picked from some key distribution. The message M is encrypted under the key, yielding a ciphertext, and the goal of the adversary, of course, is to guess the underlying message. We assume here that the adversary knows the message distribution, also knows the key distribution. The adversary wins this game if its guess is correct. So you appreciate that with PBE, the adversary wins with high probability after mu sub one half guesses. And again, this was Joe Bonneau's notation for the number of guesses required to crack a password in the weak half of a password database. Practice something like four million. An unbounded adversary, if you assume keys of bounded length, will win this game 100% of the time. The adversary will essentially just exhaust the key space. With honey encryption, we can do better. The basis for honey encryption is something I'll refer to as a generator. In the paper, we call it a distribution transforming encoder, but I'm going to use the simpler term generator here. What a generator does is uh, act as a function g mapping seeds, which are just bit strings of a particular length, from a seed space into the message space. So for example, g might map the seed 00, zero to the message Spain. A good generator is one that models the message distribution well, in the sense that if you pick a seed uniformly at random and then apply the generator to it, you'll get back the message distribution, like this. We also require, as a technical matter here, that G be invertible. That's to say that if you pick a message, you can find the corresponding seed or a corresponding seed. We'll assume it's chosen uniformly at random from the set of pre-images of a, a message under G. So for example, a, a natural choice of generator for this uh, toy system here would map 00, 0 to Spain, 0, 01 to Greece, and the other two bit strings to Sicily. You see we get the right probabilities in the message distribution with this mapping. Okay, so we have our generator G. Honey encryption also makes use of a mapping from keys or passwords onto seeds. And this mapping, which we'll call F, is quite simple. All that F does is map passwords or keys randomly onto the seed space. In practice, F might just be a hash function. So we'll assume that we, when we have a password, we hash it into the seed space. We've got our generator G, we can use to map seeds onto messages and vice versa. We've got our uh, function f, which maps keys or passwords onto seeds. And given these two things, f and g, honey encryption is actually quite simple. To encrypt a message, m under a key k, we first compute a seed corresponding to the message. Remember the function g is invertible. And then we compute a seed corresponding to our key or password. Again, we may just hash the password or the, or the key. And the encryption can be as simple as XORing these two things together. Essentially, you're encrypting the seed corresponding to the message under the key. There are other ways to do this. This is a uh, particularly simple one. To show you how this works, let me give you an example. Suppose we want to encrypt the message Sicily under the password hush. What we do is apply the inverse generator to Sicily. That's to say, we find a seed corresponding to our target message. And then we hash the password we'd like to use here, hush. Right? We map the password onto a seed. And then, as I said, all we have to do is XOR the two together. We XOR 1, 1 and 1, 0. We get 0, 1. That's our ciphertext. To decrypt now, we do the obvious thing. We take the password. We hash it into the seed space, get 1, 1. And now we XOR in the ciphertext, recovering the original seed. We take our seed. We map into the message distribution, and we recover the correct message. Now, where things get interesting is if you try to decrypt under the wrong password. Right? Suppose we try to decrypt using the password secret instead of the password hush. Well, then 
we apply f, we get the seed 0, 0. Now, we XOR in the ciphertext, gets, gives us 0, 1. We apply the generator G, and we get a message. We get a perfectly valid looking message, but we get the wrong message. We get the message Greece instead of the message Sicily. Right? That's the idea in a nutshell. The important point here is decryption, again, under any key yields a valid message. Well, what can we say about this? Given a perfect generator, it turns out that an adversary's best strategy is simply to choose the most probable key or password and decrypt under that key or password to generate his guess. So that, that's the adversary's best strategy. So we beat the brute force bound here. Let w, for instance, be the weight of the maximum weight key. In the case of passwords, this is like uh, 1%. As I mentioned, the most probable password in the Yahoo database was selected by 1% of users. Well, what I'm saying here is that an adversary can decrypt a message encrypted using passwords successfully with probability about 1%. Whereas with regular PBE, an unbounded adversary of this type can decrypt successfully 100% of the time just by exhausting the key space, the password space. Uh, we've got a number of examples of honey encryption schemes in the paper. One, for instance, applying to RSA private keys. In this case, we can say in the random oracle model, if we've got a 2L bit modulus and we're working with T bit seeds, and there's some other parameters here, that we get a message recovery bound looking something like this. Uh, this is a messy looking equation, but the important thing to observe here is that as L grows, uh, delta drops to zero quite quickly. Delta decays exponentially, essentially, in L. For the values of L we would use in practice, L again being the bit length of a prime here, say 512 or 1024, deltas for all intents and purposes zero. So that first term is effectively W. The second term goes to zero when T is large with respect to L. Unfortunately, that means substantial ciphertext expansion. T is the seed size. We're saying that the seed has to be substantially larger than the message, it has to be super linear essentially. So the encryption scheme we've come up with, unfortunately, results in large ciphertexts. An interesting open problem is to concoct a scheme in which there's very little ciphertext expansion. Made a little bit of headway with this problem. If the key K is high entropy, then we can get normal computational security. We can think of um, honey encryption, then, as a hedge against partial t key disclosure. If the conditional entropy of the key drops, then the guarantees of honey encryption kick in and they're useful. There's a lot of other stuff in the paper, which obviously I can't cover today. For instance, security bounds in the case where the generator is imperfect, which is quite important. We don't always expect to have a good generator. Examples of generators for other types of messages, things like credit card vaults and so on and so forth. Um, and also an analysis of key to seed collisions, which turns out to yield some very interesting combinatorial problems, classic ball and bin problems. But there's a lot more to do here. Right? We would like to be able to apply honey encryption in a range of scenarios. We'd like to be able to encrypt things like password vaults, potentially even email, or at least structured fields in email. And so this problem of how to construct a good generator is fundamental. Right? It's also very interesting. Right? For RSA key encryption, as you've seen, we need, needed to know something about the distribution of primes and rely on results in number theory. For email, we have to have an understanding of natural language processing or machine learning or some other tool that enables us to generate plausible but fake email messages. For password vaults, we need to understand password choices better. We understand pretty well how individual passwords are chosen, but we don't have a good understanding as a community of how users select suites of passwords. Their passwords are undoubtedly correlated. We don't understand what those correlations look like. So lots of interesting connections here to natural language processing, combinatorics, number theory, and so on and so forth. OK, with that, let me take a step back. I mentioned that I would briefly discuss a research vision around intrusion resilience. My own interest in this area happened a or arose a few years ago when, as some of you may know, RSA suffered a, a serious breach. The key lesson was that any viable defense has to assume that the adversary is already in the network. 
This is something we knew on paper. We know on paper right, that perimeter defenses are fragile. But it really came home after this episode. Living it is different than, than reading it. For this reason, I believe that we need intrusion resilience in the sense of graceful degradation of security in systems as they become compromised, right, under partial compromise. And I think decoys and deception are an important approach to this problem. But there are a few others that I believe have to come into play as well. And I'll mention a few related lines of, of research I've, I've been working on. I've talked about honey objects and, and de decoys. And I'll just mention again that there's lots of interesting follow-up work to be done here. Um, for example, I've been working with a colleague in Switzerland on uh, application of honey objects to genomic privacy. Uh, some colleagues and I have developed a game theoretic model of compromise, of contention, ongoing contention between an attacker and defender called Flip It. And this yields some very interesting insights. It also turns out to be kind of fun to play as an iPhone game. And if anyone's interested after this talk, I can show you a kind of rudimentary version of it. If an adversary is breaking in and stealing secrets, one of the best things you can do is to rotate secrets on a frequent basis. This is relatively easy to do in a high, highly resourced system, but turns out to be quite challenging in systems that are not well endowed. For example, um, in constrained devices like RFID tags or embedded devices like authentication tokens. Here, key evolution is tricky, and that's an, been another area of interest for me. Uh, but crypto and game theory and these sort of uh, hard sciences, as it were, are only one piece of the story and possibly not even the most important piece. Another area that I've been exploring recently is security analytics, the use of security logs generated by enterprises and other organizations to detect intrusions. This is fundamentally a big data problem, but it's harder than your usual big data problem, which is hard enough. Because not only do you have the usual challenges of big data, you've got an adversary trying to mess you up. So this is a really interesting problem. I will mention that there are some cryptographic facets to the problem as well. Commercial offerings today offer, uh, provide essentially no integrity protection on logs. It's possible for an adversary to tamper with them all along the chain of custody, which of course is a very bad thing. There's no point in performing security analytics on logs you don't trust to begin with. In summary, then, it's inevitable that adversaries will gain access to important resources. This has just become a fact of life. But I hope I've persuaded you that deception and honey objects in, in particular can be potent countermeasures, things like honey words and, and honey encryption. More broadly, I think intrusion detection and intrusion resilience are going to require new and flexible defenses. And these defenses are going to have to be conceived across interdisciplinary lines. So you can think of this talk as a call for those of you who are not in security to come join in this venture. OK, thank you very much. I think we've got some time for questions. Yes? Uh, for honey encryption, I was wondering, here in this case, the attacker may also check the information the passport, password vault, you can easily check whether the password unlocks the account, et cetera, right? Right. So I wonder, have you done analysis on, on this part? In other words, if attackers check, so it doesn't need to be top choice anymore, right? If you can allow to do futures. Even if you use honey tokens now, what is the probability that you, know, you need to really integrate maybe somehow both of them? Right. right. So I mean, and I don't know how the analysis will change when the attacker can try it. Yeah, that's something we've not explored formally yet, uh, but we've considered in two ways. I guess the first is um, to construct a honey encryption scheme in which if you know the underlying secret, it's possible to detect the submission of a, um, a decoy, corresponding decoy. Right? So for instance, if a service provider knows your password, it would be nice if the service provider can detect the submission of an incorrect password that resulted from incorrect decryption of your password vault. And that actually seems as though it may be feasible. The second way to approach this is just to hope that there's enough underlying entropy. It doesn't have to be a huge amount. So that an attacker starts, uh, especially one that's trying to mount a systemic impersonation attack, attacker starts locking down accounts. There's a flurry of attempts against um, uh, 
against uh, users' accounts resulting from a password vault breach, and you're able in a timely way to detect the fact that this breach, which will involve multiple users, has happened. But th this, is, this is precisely the type of question we need to ask if we want to deploy this in the real world. Uh, just to follow up, as far as I know, RSA event happened because of kind of malware and targeted attacks. So I guess none of this research project addressed RSA. Uh, well, um, it originated with a um, social engineering attack, but uh, any um, advanced persistent threat, as these things are often called, will involve a considerable amount of reconnaissance. If you can lure such an adversary into a trap, get the adversary to start touching honey objects, that could actually be a very helpful way of detecting such attacks in progress. So I would, I would not say that the RSA attack would fail to benefit from the use of honey objects. Any other? Yeah. Adam? Yeah, meta question. So you mentioned at the beginning of the talk that you thought that these sort of, these types of you know, broadly decoy approaches are under, undervalued, underappreciated. Do you, do you think that's because they are, um, so, so in general, you know, there's some value to obscurity and how you design your your system. How you insert decoys seems to be one of those places where you know obscurity, uh, at least naively, could be particularly helpful, right? And so, do you think one of the reasons it's gotten less discussion, uh, at least in the you know in the deployment of practical systems, is that people are just less comfortable discussing it, or is it? Or, or do you think that there's really, uh, you know, people just don't don't appreciate the value, you know, period? So, so you're asking whether um, because honey objects have been classified as a uh, security through obscurity method, they've somehow become tarnished? No, no, uh, no, just that people are, like, that, uh, you know, people who are discussing how a particular system was designed would be less comfortable discussing the details. Of Oh, oh, I see. In other words, it is used, but we just don't know it. Is that the? Or yeah, or it, it's not as obvious when you read the literature because people are less comfortable discussing it. Well, I will say, I mean, it, it is used in many places, but um, there are very few commercial products, for instance, that uh, implement it. It hasn't been used to protect password vaults. There are many places in which it hasn't been used where it is pretty clearly useful. So I think there's a lot of room for further exploration. It's not to say that it. it hasn't been deployed. I mentioned honey tokens, for instance, uh, bogus credit card numbers, which are used essentially universally. Um, but there are many areas in which it, it hasn't been. And I think also what's been missing is a principled approach to the deployment of honey objects. That's not something that we've, we've seen before. And that, I would hope, would help fuel the further use of this technique. Yeah, so I guess for credit cards, it seems like you know, one of the things that makes it relatively easy is that they're the, the kind of the generator is sort of obvious. That's right. With the distribution you That's right. simulate is yes. clear. Yeah. I guess the point you're making is that one could in principle do this for other. Yeah, other in, pr in principle you can do this for other things. It may be that the very simplicity of the distribution has uh, been uh, an impetus for the use of, of honey objects, where, whereas elsewhere the gen generation is a more involved process and that may have deterred people or not stimulate their imaginations, or I have no idea what. But uh, I think there is a, a lot of room to run with these, these ideas. And uh, it's not clear why the community hasn't really embraced them. And, you know, clear, clearly they've been used for thousands of years, right? So there's some fundamental utility here. Uh, what happens with, uh, or is there a way to use honey encryption for multiple, like safely for, for multiple encryptions? So using the, the, the same password? Yes, you can use the same password for multiple encryptions. But of course, a caveat is that if you um, break one ciphertext, right, you determine the correct underlying plain text, you've got the password and the, the whole and, thing falls apart. Do you need to have like a model of, uh, in plain text distribution, like the you know, one word might, is correlated with the next word, does that need to be modeled in some way to safely do this? Or? Yeah, if the distributions are not independent, then you have to be extremely careful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was triggered by the discussion just now. Um, 
So you mentioned that in credit card, in the credit card in industry, these uh, money tokens, um, bogus credit card numbers, are it's basically best practice in the industry. And then at the start, you mentioned a couple of these password breaches in you know with basic internet companies and industry leaders. Um, why would you assume? Why would you think that in the credit card industry, apparently this approach is a best practice, but you know at Adobe, Yahoo, this kind of place, apparently it's not. It's a real mystery. Um, they were not even applying best practices to hashing. Right? So Adobe uh, encrypted its passwords, but it was using ECB mode encryption, which is not a good, good choice. In some cases, uh, hashing was applied without salt, and so on and so forth. I mean, I think it just boils down to lack of resources, that often these protections are rolled by administrators uh, under time pressure and perhaps without a strong background in security. So they do what's easiest um, and with limited knowledge of the, the security implications. Right. Short follow up. Um, so in many state laws, there is a safe harbor for uh, when you encrypt the data set. Right. Um, when you suffer a security or a data breach, you won't have to report. But it doesn't say anything about, uh, you know, as you, as you mentioned, um, for encryption, basically, or for CFC, right? Yes, that's right. Do you think, uh, working uh, on these issues for, for years and also in the industry, do you think that uh, creating incentives through like law or policy or that kind of stuff, does it, does it help? Does it increase adoption? Um, does it create incentives for not necessarily the security engineers at the company, but more for like, the boardroom to actually take it more seriously? Or what are your ideas? Yeah, I mean, implementing uh, security through or rather uh, policy making for information security is a really delicate game. You don't want to be too prescriptive, right, because technologies become outmoded quickly. On the other hand, you don't want laws to be framed too loosely because then people will do things like implementing poor encryption. Um, I think at least that laws respecting information security raise awareness. And that's quite an important function. And maybe that's ultimately the most important function of, uh, yeah. of, of good laws. In the credit card industry, there's a more direct relationship with actual financial damages, or maybe that's, that's not possible. That's true, although why we don't have chip and pin in the US then right, yeah. becomes the obvious question. Yeah, yeah. 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 These, are, these, are, these are very complicated questions. Yeah. OK, well, thank you. <laughs>